Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone. So today we had Ibrahim Jambud and it was an amazing conversation. We talked about so many things from being a poet, family man, being able to play professional basketball. And we even talked about the seal of the Prophet and how the Quran shaped the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So be tuned, stay ready. Here it is. So Ibrahim, what are you passionate about? I'm passionate about a lot of things. Um, I'm, I love to create. So uh, from the standpoint of poetry, um, specifically spoken word poetry, I've been writing that for two decades since I was the age of uh, 15, basically. Um, and I've published a lot of books um, for specifically Islamic poetry. Mm -hmm. um, so I do a lot of writing. Uh, I did a lot more when I was younger. That's that's probably at the top of my list. Um now, as a family man, I would say I'm also very, very um, passionate about just um, my family, you know, as a father of five, <laughs> believe All it or not. Back. Yeah, I'm very passionate about um, raising my children um, up to be upright, righteous, virtuous, savvy, you yeah. know, witty, uh, well-rounded uh, uh, human beings. Um, so definitely um, passionate about being a husband, um, of course, even before that. Um, and yeah, uh, so many different things I'm passionate about. Uh, obviously, basketball. Uh, I've been playing basketball since I was four years old. Um, got to play um, at the highest level, professional, mm -hmm. um, and spent hours and hours in the parks and in the gyms and in the weight room and um, traveling, you know, to, to see that dream uh, through. Um, and it's something that I carry with me until this day, I would say. So uh, I, I have probably too many passions. <laughs> but I think now at my age, I'm really focused on kind of um, tying up loose strings. Yeah. So like uh, when I talk about poetry, you know, I have certain visions that I want to uh, fulfill with my poetry. And so, you know, I have a lot of kind of like unfinished projects that I want to tie up. Mm -hmm. um, other books and other subjects, um, history. Uh, my father is a forensic historian, you know, and I've been kind of uh, drawing inspiration from his work. Right. And also trying to fi finish up uh, some projects um, in that area as well. You know, so that's what I'm, I'm really passionate about now is like um, being more concerned that I won't be able to complete my life work. Yeah. You know, before my time runs out, you yeah. know. And so I feel like that's what kind of keeps me up at night, you know, and also gets me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I love that answer. Cause it's cool because we're so multifaceted as individuals. Right. Mm -hmm. We are not just. I only do poetry. I only am a family man. I'm only this. Like you have all these interests. <laughs> yeah. And when you have all these interests laid out in front of you and you're looking at them like, okay, I need to delegate what much time to each and everything that I'm doing. Mm. And then knowing how to delegate your time in and yeah. of itself is the skill to be like, what's the most important thing right now to focus on? But yeah. it's so hard when you see things on the back of it that <laughs> you really want to get to. Like to sit yeah. down and write a book, it requires so much time mm. to just sit there and think and have like nothing else on your mind besides that one task yeah and it's so hard like you were saying it's different when like i used to write so much more when i was younger because i had more free time to just think and write yeah but i think that's awesome like especially with poetry right i would say when i was younger i had more free time but my process was different mm -hmm. so i used to force a lot of writing mm -hmm. i used to go sit down and say okay i'm going to write now yeah now i don't do that now I've kind of like had enough experience in writing. I understand my process um, a lot better, right? So now I, I wait for the inspiration to come. So mm -hmm. like if I'm really, really inspired to write something, then I'll maybe jot down a note or two in that moment of inspiration and then yeah. I'll come back to it later, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like uh, my poetry uh, specifically is, is more guided now you know, yeah. by process, you know, and just by me moving about by experience as well, right, than it used to be, you mm -hmm. know. So definitely time constraints when you get older, but I also feel like um, when something, you know, comes to you, 
then it comes a lot more easy, right? Mm-hmm. It comes a lot easier um, as opposed to trying to force it, yeah. you know? So. That makes a lot of sense, too. And it's interesting, too, that you said, like, you played, like, professional basketball at some point, and, like, you kind of went to that grind and that motion. Yeah. How much... I always tell people this because being, like, a, <laughs> like, an ex-athlete as well, like, in college and everything, I always tell people, like, the way I got better at soccer and, mm-hmm. like, the way I improved myself constantly and watching videos and putting the hours in, the repetitions, Oof. that skill, right, mm. has translated over into every other aspect of my life. So I wanted to ask, like, how much is basketball and, like, that grind mindset, like, going out at the gym, doing the extra reps, kicking up 100 shots every this way, 100 shots left hand, 100 shots right hand, left hand and layups. Like, you got it. How did that translate to the other aspects of your life? Um, I would say 100%. Um, a full translation, I would not be the person that I am today um, if not for my basketball experience, you know, from as early as the age of four. Yeah. You know, developing character, you know, leadership qualities, uh, the ability to communicate verbally and non-verbally, yeah. you know, to, yeah. to signal people to do certain things, mm-hmm. you know, um, just intuition and instinct, right? Focus, uh, being able to contain yourself and be poised in, in intense pressure situations, you know. Yeah. So I would say that, as I already said, I'm not the person that I am today, uh, if not for basketball. When I enter a space and my ability to uh, analyze mm-hmm. and, and and make conclusions and then kind of dictate and delegate, yeah. you know what I mean? All of that is something that was sharpened in that space, you know? And this is why, um, as a youth worker, a professional youth worker, um, I never discourage youth from engaging in sports mm-hmm. because I know how invaluable that uh experience is in terms of developing their character, developing uh, their personality and just sharpening them, you know, and refining them as people. Yeah. You know, so I am the person I I am today because of basketball in a lot of ways. And I feel that Allah, God Almighty, put that in my life, as he so often does with people, in order to develop them in certain ways whatever our tailor-made test is or our tailor-made talent is we have those things in order to develop us uh into the people that god almighty wants us to ultimately become Mm -hmm. no i love that and it's so funny because even when i play like other sports that are aren't Mm -hmm. soccer right it's it's like you said like scanning the floor right or like seeing the vision like having my eyes up as i'm dribbling the basketball and like yeah. i'm not a basketball player at all by means. <laughs> i'm athletic and i understand spacing and movement and play the great defense right everyone knows yeah. the soccer player who plays defense like they're on in your face the whole time <laughs> but i would, people would always be like oh like nice pass like how did you see that oh nice pass like, how did mm. you see that and all it is is that in soccer it's all about those disguised passes yeah. that's one of my better traits in soccer is like the attacking player who makes a disguise pass in between this in between the lines. Yeah. So when I translate that to basketball, everyone's like, oh, how'd you even see that? It's like yeah. because I understand spacing. So it's so cool, cool. It's like you can take skills from other things you get in life yeah. and apply them to other things. Yeah. And then with like you said, like sports, like the grind mindset, which like sometimes it's just not your day, right? You're putting up a hundred shots. I made like five shots, ten shots, fifteen shots, like but then the next day I'll make fifty. Next day I'll make sixty. Mm. So I'm hot and cold, hot and cold. Gotcha. But in life and in business and in work and relationships with people, not every day is ten out of ten. Exactly. So that's so funny. Like you were saying, like it's it teaches you about life. Even if, like you said, like the, like the <laughs> eyes. Like for example, like some players I've played with in my past. I remember just a look. They knew exactly what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. A, Oh, they moved exactly what I thought. It was like a snap between one another. (laughs) But in life, sometimes even in relationships and business and talking to people, you'll notice that they're not picking up on that cue. Yeah. Oh, they didn't pick up. You didn't peep. Oh, man. Why did you see what I was trying to say? Like, (laughs) I was trying to like nonverbal communicate with you. But in sports, you learn that. So it's awesome to see how sports really does translate to so many other aspects of life. Yeah. Actually, um, my brother, my older brother, Luke, man, he's also a former professional basketball co- uh, basketball player and also a college basketball coach. Um, he has a company uh, called All Ball, right? So it's all B-A-L-L, basketball and life lessons, mm-hmm. right? So basically the premise behind that is that it carries over from the court, you know, into your real life, you know? Mm-hmm. And so when he does his training and when I do my training, we try to incorporate life lessons based on you know what's happening on on the court you know 
keeping your eye on the goal, mm-hmm. right? Defending your goals, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's a big thing in soccer, right? You yeah. have to defend your goal, but it's yeah. a big thing in life as well, right? Mm-hmm. You have to defend your goals, right? And and flexibility, you have to be flexible. Communication, all of these are just life skills, you know. So when I look at sport, that's what I see. I see the life skills component. Not everybody's going to make it to the highest level, be a professional, etc., right? But you can take the benefit from it, and it can help you in other spaces. Yeah, you know. A lot of uh, athletes who play college sports and even high school sports, they are more successful when they go into corporate America or they become teachers and stuff because they have that that life experience that now they can relate to the new space that they enter. Yeah, no, I really do like appreciate that too because even for me, sometimes I'll look at like how even in our society now, how children grow up with more video game opportunities and yeah. playing inside all the time. And, you know, it's fun. Like, it's not yeah. bad or 100% wrong to play video games here and there. But when you notice, like, the video games now, it's like, say you're playing only solo games that you can just play by yourself, queue into a lobby by yourself yeah. versus when I was younger, remember the Xbox 360 live <laughs> chats that you joined in with all the friends, 2K, this, and you're just talking, chatting, back and forth, the banter. It's like... Even then, it's like, at least you're in a community, right? Yeah. But nowadays, I'll notice that, like, a lot of people play a lot of games that are very, like, solo-driven. The Battle Pass method, where it's like, you mm. get your, you buy your own little subscription to this Battle Pass that gives you rewards, and you have to complete the quest by yourself, mm. and get all these things that's not as team-oriented sometimes. Yeah. And I kind of noticed that. But then, nowadays, you see in athletes, they're getting injured more often. Okay, why are they getting injured more often? And then, there's, like, all these studies that show, like, simple, like, games like Tag are the best for ACL prevention for kids. Because mm. what is tag? It's constant darting left, right, yeah. up, down, all these different Change things. Change of direction. Even like recess and stuff. It's like they should be playing outside, running, falling, all these different things. Mm. But nowadays when you have more opportunity to stay inside, even if you're an athlete and go to practice, when you go home, are you like, oh, your friend knocks on your door, hey, come outside, we're going to play basketball. And like when you're a kid, you have this unlimited energy. I remember going to a, <laughs> a practice and track practice and another soccer practice and mm. you're just buzzing because like you're young, like you're 16, yeah. 17, you have all this energy, you're not going to get as injured. And you don't, like now that I'm 25, 26 years old, like I'm like, oh, I'm kind of so sore from yesterday. Like, oh, I can't run like that. Like, you see, <laughs> I don't recover as quick. So then you start thinking, I have to take care of my body more. Mm. But when you're young, it's so elastic. So yeah. there's all these different things. But then now you're thinking, are they getting those skills that need to be learned? You know, and like, then the kids are so behind those phones, then you're, are they learning the communication skills that you're saying we learned? Yeah. So then it's like all these little things. So it's interesting to see how like the sports technology and like where we're going with it is kind mm. of like we're in this like gray area currently. Yeah. I mean, I think you said probably more than I can say on the subject of, you know, video games and technology and how it's kind of transforming the social dynamic, you know, between people. Um, People are comfortable, you know, or more comfortable at least, right? Not having uh, the deep relationships, the deep friendships, you know, not being outside and and using that energy because you have that... um, that machine or, you know, that device that mm-hmm. provides you the immediate gratification, you know, because everybody's seeking fulfillment. If I can get it right away, right here, right now, then why do I need to go outside and get it, you know? So definitely the social dynamic has has changed and it's just something to keep an, keep an eye on, just like the weather, right? Like yeah. what's going to happen, you know? Um, you can't say that it's all bad and you definitely can't say that it's all good, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think uh, as a Muslim you know, uh, balance it, and moderation is the important thing, right? Mm-hmm. Is to actually not overdo it, you know, take the benefit from it, right? But don't take it to a level where it becomes harmful, mm-hmm. you know, in different ways. Yeah. yeah. No, I really do appreciate like that kind of understanding. And I kind of wanted to ask you about when, with your poetry, was it always Islamic poetry or were you kind of writing just based off, again, you're saying like running off of emotion or how you felt, or was it always just like an Islamic background to it? Um, so I would say there was always, um, a consciousness of Islam kind of like subtly there. I knew that I couldn't say certain things, Yeah, you know, and so there are those lines that are there, even if, uh, someone who's not Muslim and doesn't understand the kind of Islamic paradigm, you know, they wouldn't recognize those lines. But a Muslim would be like, "Oh, I see, I see, I see what he did there." Yeah, you yeah. know, um, when I was uh, fifteen, I say I kind of pushed those lines a little bit more. Um, but the more I kind of grew in knowledge, the more I I begin to respect those lines, right, mm-hmm. and then see like 
the the beauty of staying within those lines. You know, like poetry traditionally has forms. Yeah. Right? It's like you have to do A, A, B, B, or, you know, these type of forms. But also now you have a form from your religious perspective is that you can't do this here, you know? Yeah. So you kind of keep in those forms, and that's where your challenge, right? Now you, you master the form, and that's what I've done over the years is really work in the um, Islamic poetry form in mm -hmm. terms of content um, specifically, and that's kind of guided me to be able to do the work that I've done. I've actually... Um, just for your information, I don't know how much you did it, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of research on me, but I've I've performed on five continents. Mm -hmm. I've performed in Australia. I've performed across the UK. Did tours, uh, Canada, uh, Kuwait, Malaysia, you know, Egypt, um, and so forth. You know, and so I feel like um, through kind of sticking within the lines, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala put kabul on the work that I was doing with the poetry, even, you know, because I could have been doing it a, a different way, you yeah. know, especially early on, it was very influenced by, like, the hip-hop culture. Mm -hmm. And so, just a little bit more context for you as well, like, my father, uh, Imam, my mm -hmm. uncle, Imam. <laughs> yeah, so you always had my, that Islamic My grandfather, background. Imam, you yeah. know, so I was very much inspired by their ability um, to public speak, you know, to speak in front of audiences or congregations and inspire them, you know, but at the same time, I didn't want to be like, like an imam, like a, a minister or anything like that. And so I kind of had like this on one side, right, this spiritual kind of leadership uh, directly impacting me and shaping me as a young person. But then you have like urban America just like shouting at you, right? Yeah. Like, you know, this this hip hop culture and, and, and pop culture in general, right? And, you know, I would basically came to this middle ground between the two is where like, okay, how can I in incorporate this inspiration, this Islamic inspiration that I love so much with somewhat of something that would appeal to the, that urban space. And that's how mm -hmm. I kind of began to develop my, my style as a writer, mm -hmm. you know, um, one of my earliest, I would say, hits, right? Something mm -hmm. that really spread throughout the, the internet. Scripture, my hopes, was like literally um, <clears throat> the culmination of, of that idea. And I just started kind of like shouting out things that, you know, you would be inspired by from the minbar, mm -hmm. but in a way that was like poetic, yeah. right? I want to know Mecca to Medina by foot, but I'm too busy with life. I want to know... Uh, Ibrahim or Abraham like a father and I'll be the sacrifice. I want to know Jerusalem like the true followers of Christ, but Moses did not know the promised land and he was still granted paradise, right? So these are things that mm -hmm. you would be inspired from, for, uh, inspired by, excuse me, if you heard them from the member, right? Mm -hmm. But then it's like, okay, how do I speak to my people? These youth who are, you know, that their language is expression. Their expression is is poetry and and, and rap and and all of that, right? And so that's kind of where I found myself at fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and I, I vividly remember. Um, uh, they used to have these like rap battles on the corner. Yeah, I don't know if they do yeah, that yeah. anymore. It maybe like at school I and the stuff lunch like tables, that. The lunch tables, <laughs> the lunch remember, tables, right? right? Um, and my, my parents did not like for me to be present on any corner in our neighborhood, yeah. you know, um, because of some, and this is Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, and, you know, anything can happen on those corners. You mm -hmm. don't know what other people have on them, you know, and how the scenario could basically unfold. Right. So they never like for me to be on those corners, you know, but you find yourself in situations at times where you, you can't really escape it. And uh, this particular time, they were actually on the corner in front of my house. Yeah. <laughs> so I was kind of like there, you know, as like a fly on the wall. And they were having this uh, rap cipher um, between a few guys in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. two different neighborhoods, right? And it yeah. was really heated. And out of nowhere comes this guy. And I've never seen this guy before. I never saw him again. Like, this was the only moment. Yeah. That, you know, and he came in and 
he wasn't rapping. He was doing more of a spoken word, spitting knowledge, yeah, uh, kind of style. And everybody was just like kind of humbled, yeah, you know, by this guy, this kind of like older guy, probably maybe thirty. Mm-hmm. And he, but to you guys, like a bunch of fifteen year olds, yeah, yeah, yeah he's right. Like, oh, like our elders kind of, yeah. He's like an yeah. elder, right? And um. He dropped it, you know, like mic drop kind yeah. of like thing. And everybody's like, whoa, whoa. And that was like the end of the cypher, you know. And so that made an impression on me, too. That was like one of my early introductions to the spoken word, you know. And I feel like, you know, I, I was kind of guided towards that and shown that path early on. Yeah. You know, to kind of set me up uh, for later in life, you know, when I would actually kind of develop my craft and be able to use it. Um to communicate a message to people. Yeah, it's so cool because Allah will literally put little things and little tidbits of yeah. things. Like you said, like I remember talking to someone saying, like, I was thinking about becoming Muslim and I was Muslim when I was younger. Then, like, I went away with it because my grandfather was the Muslim one in our family and then mm. he moved away. So then Islam left my life. Fast forward 10, 15 years, he's like, I'm going through a really bad time, all these different things. And I started like, let me get back right. Let me go yeah. back to my my boxing gym and working out, doing all these things. And then fast forward a week, some guy in the street, he's taking out the trash. He's like, oh, like you Muslim? He's like, you box? He's like, you box? He's like, yeah. He's like, how does this random guy know? He's like, mm. yeah, I do. He's like, oh, blah, blah. He's like, oh, like you Muslim? He was like, how did he know that? Wow. This past week, I'm like been thinking about it again. He was like, come to the masjid. Come mm. pray, blah, blah, blah. And, and then he's like, you know what? I'm going to take my shahada that next Friday. And he goes, I went to find him that Friday at the masjid. Didn't see him. Mm. So he's like, it's like the most moments where yeah, it's like yeah. someone just comes into your life for that yeah. one moment where you're like, Allah put them in that in your life for that one moment to see that to then inspire you for the next however much of your life. Yeah. So it's like it kind of made me yeah, feel like that yeah. same energy. That's, yeah. that's awesome. And I have I have a ton of stories, I think, in my, my own life um like that. Um you know, there's there's three modes of communication I would say with the divine. Um, and the first is his creation. His creation is, is always telling us about him, right? Always communicating to us of his glory, of his majesty, of his knowledge, of his power, of, you know, his infinite wisdom. Um, it's all there, you know, in the creation. But then you have a deeper uh, level of communication, which is his revelation, right? Things that he spelled out in detail that we couldn't necessarily know just from looking at the sun and the moon and the yeah. sky, you know? Yeah. Like the revelation is more detailed, you know? It gives us real instruction and guidance. But then the third level of communication is his decree, right? Those things that he kind of tailor made, you know, to mm-hmm. speak to you directly, yeah. to, you know, keep you on a path or to guide you to the path, right? Keep you away from from certain things, you know? And so when I look at my life, you know, those those are the things that I look for that really uh, draw me closer to him. Mm-hmm. I can see how he was protecting me now when I look back in hindsight from going down a particular path. Mm-hmm. You know, I can see how he was moving me towards my dreams. You know, I didn't just wake up and become a professional basketball player. I didn't just wake up and become, you know. A, and show up on a stage in Malaysia. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. No, there were things that happened in, throughout the course of my life that put me on that path, that set me on that path. And they were completely out of my control. You know, I always tell people about, you know, at the age of 13, my father came to me and said, we're moving to Morocco. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I'm living in Richmond, Virginia at the time. Uh, We just won the the middle school basketball championship. Mm -hmm. Mind you, my dream is to play professional basketball, you know. And I'm going to be in eighth grade next year, and I'm going to be one of the captains on the team, you mm-hmm. know. So I kind of have my mind set on going back to school. the middle school yeah. and, and kind of going for a, a repeat championship, right? And out of nowhere, my father says, we're moving to Morocco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you understand? And then it's like in your eighth grade mindset, you're like, Dad, you're throwing a wrench in what I think is right exactly. for my life and all these you know, things. Even though I wouldn't dare say that, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Um you know, um, yeah, definitely. So I, I thought it was a negative thing, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, as much as I look back now, I can see how much I benefited more from going to Morocco mm-hmm. than I would have benefited by staying in Richmond, Virginia and playing on, you know, my middle school team. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was thinking about, you know, oh, we're going to be competing for the city championship. 
right? But what we ended up doing that year, because I ended up going to Morocco, is actually competing for the national championship. Oh, man. Right? In, in the country, you know, not just a state, you know what I mean? So there was so much more benefit in that. And then when I was 15, uh, my mother came to me and she said, we're moving to New Jersey, right? So we came back from Morocco, went back to Virginia, but then now, you know, we're moving to New Jersey. I'm like, what are we moving to New Jersey for? You know yeah. what I mean? I'm settled here now again, you know, and I just didn't see the wisdom behind the divine decree, you know, at that age, right? But when I went to New Jersey, I actually had um, a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. This guy would lift, make me lift weights, would teach me how to shoot, would work me out, would literally uh, start leagues, <laughs> like yeah. build leagues around me so that I can have more experience and like development and Yeah, right? And so all of those things, again, were out of my control, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I look at my experience and I look at my life, I see the divine decree. I see how he's moving me around to bring me closer to my dreams, mm -hmm. you know? In those one, two years in Morocco, did you get to play basketball at all or was it just like... So I mentioned we ended up competing for the national championship, mm -hmm. right? So in Morocco, it was like Arabic, Quran, basketball, mm -hmm. and I was actually supposed to be doing homeschooling, <laughs> <laughs> right? Didn't get around to that part, you know, over the, the 10 months that I was there. Um, but alhamdulillah, like, I feel there's there's a certain barakah in the Qur'an that's intangible, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't really measure it or eye it, right? And there's also that, that barakah and just being righteous to your parents, right? Like, I went over there For them. in obedience yeah. to my, my parents, more so than I wanted to be there, right? And so without even really opening a textbook for the whole year, I came back and I took a placement test. And instead of placing eighth grade or ninth grade, I actually placed like grades ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I went to the ninth grade anyway because... That know, was how old you were. Yeah, like, yeah. It was necessary for me to do that. But a lot of my scores were like 11th, 12th grade scores, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I feel like there was a barakah in that. But yeah, of course, we played basketball. Yeah. You know, um, that was one of the primary things. We competed for a team, a club called uh, Samir mm -hmm. um, in uh, a town called Mohammedi or outside of Casablanca. Mm -hmm. And the coach said, here you go, here's the ball. You know, I was like the only American, only foreign player. There was an expectation that I was going to be good. I was pretty good, right? But mm -hmm. I was kind of middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. I was always on good teams. I was always on winning teams. And sometimes having so much talent around you, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You get over overlooked. You yeah. know, so this was the time for me to shine and develop and actually make a lot of mistakes. And like be a, almost like develop into a star. Like a star. Where you take charge. Or someone's a like, leader. Well, give him the ball because he's better than us. So Yeah, time's we, winding down. We need you to carry us right now. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and so that's why I said my that year in Morocco was more valuable than the year that I potentially would have had mm -hmm. in, in middle school, you yeah. know. And I didn't understand that until later on when I came back. And, and my brother, Luke Mann, as well, he went and we came back. And our coaches and our teammates from before, they were like, what happened? Like, you know? oh, you bossed up. Are you nice Yeah, now? yeah. You get it, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like a, a totally different player, a totally different mentality just over that short period of time, you know. And so, like I said uh, before, the, the the decree of the divine, you know, is one way that he he's communicating with us. You know, mm -hmm. we just have to go with it, you know, in order to see, you know, the, the destination that he's actually leading us to. Yeah, no, that's, that's so awesome, too, because, like, even for me, like, I remember, like, when I was in England, uh, I studied abroad for, like, a semester when I was abroad. And I've always been athletic all my life. And the one thing I've always noticed that I started playing, like, soccer, like, mm. in, like, a team, and, like, end of sixth grade, seventh grade. But, like, to start a sport that late, yeah. especially a sport like soccer, which is a high level of skill where it's, like, you're playing with your feet. So it's, like, yeah. basketball, if, say if you're super tall and you know how to catch, you're already, like, a couple of miles ahead of, like, most people. Mm. Well, it's, you know what I mean? I, I might have athletic. to refute you on athletic, that though. one. You're telling yeah. me, like, athletic. I'm saying, like, <laughs> as, like, an athletic thing. I get it, I get it, I get it. You know what I mean? But, you know, we're talking basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> basketball, you know, people sometimes... Uh, don't give it the 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 due respect i would say in terms of the amount of skill oh no you know, it's high skill very few people are able to start late in basketball 
and and develop into mm-hmm. like a pro or, yeah, or a, like a high yeah. level superstar, you know. Mm-hmm. So I would say it's very very similar, obviously, to all soccer. Like those, yeah. it's, it's all the minute details that matter. Yeah. That's why Kobe Bryant would take how many shots and train how hard to become yeah. where he was. It is not just like by accident. And with soccer, it's like you're using your feet. So it's like okay, yeah. that's already like a the beginning of like okay, I yeah. can learn to use my feet with the ball versus yeah. like. Your hands, which you use every day more yeah. than your feet in the sense of like controlling a ball. Your feet is a lot different than trying to catch. Because yeah. more intuitively, you'll do the catching more than yeah, your foot. For sure. And I remember thinking like, oh, but I was athletic and I loved watching. So I knew what to do. I thought you knew what to do, but I couldn't actually do the technical thing that I was watching these pro players do when mm. I was watching. And I go through this like knowledge of learning, learning, learning. But I always made sure to maintain one thing was my athleticism. So I was the guy on the field that would not stop running. Mm. So any coach would be like, listen, he might not be the best, but he will run the entire game. So they would play me, especially when it's rec league. Yeah. Like, you got a kid who can run all day. Play him. Okay. And then I kept getting better, and I was intuitively getting goals. And I was like, okay, I know what to do now. I'm getting better one by one. Mm. Coming to high school, I make the team. And everyone's like, how did he make the team? He never played club. And I make kids the team more of a kids who played club coach saw again the athleticism in me that never stopped running starts on the bench then ends up becoming a starter at the end of the year next year you're captain then junior year varsity yeah oh but there was kids that were sophomore varsity so oh, now i gotta compete with them bench for two games then the rest of the season i started every game mm. so it's like if you kind of notice like you kind of show the coach like i'll keep back get better keep getting better and obviously we don't have the opportunity to pay for an america like, soccer club is like two grand a season like, my dad's looking at me like, I'm like, Bubba, it's $2,000. He looked at me, he was like, you know <laughs> not going to happen, That's right? That's not happening, right? And yeah. do all these things. And ended up then being the only, like, one of the two kids in my whole high school, like, for soccer that went and played college soccer. Wow. And I'm like, huh. Like, I told people my when I was younger that I'd make, I, I can play college soccer. Everyone laughed at me. Mm. Even my senior year, I went to a camp where I had, like, my club coach that I was a practice player on. He told me, he's like, you're just not ready for college soccer. And... I kind of took offense to it. And then fast forward two years, I'm starting outside back on my team against his team. And I'm on his side like for a half. And I'm burning his outside back all mm. game, all game and outplaying him. And in my head, I just wanted to say it so bad. Like, oh, you didn't think I, it was on the <laughs> same field. It was funny. It was like on that same field. He told me I wasn't good enough. Wow. But I'm out here outplaying your entire left side. Yeah. So I was thinking in my head, like, it's like a low put those like obstacles in your life to see, are you going to grind it harder? Are you going to grind mm. harder? But then when I went to England, it was the first time I ever like got technical training. Mm. Where it was like how to actually move with the ball properly, all these little things. And once I gained the technical ability with the athleticism, it's like it leveled up my play from here to here. And everyone's yeah. like, Oh, like where'd you play D1? And it's like, Oh, I didn't play D1 actually. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like <laughs> it's, it's like a compliment now where I get that. Yeah. But it, again, it required that like understanding of you don't know why Allah made you start so late. You don't know why Allah maybe didn't make me have more privilege or money to pay yeah. for these expensive clubs when I was younger. But the story was exactly how Allah ordained it. No. And it made me have this work ethic that we talked about where I never quit now. When mm. things get hard, I don't quit. Yeah. Because I understand that it just requires your work ethic, your constant grind to achieve yeah. whatever it is you want in life. Yeah. So it's like Allah is preparing me not just to be a soccer player but in maybe it wasn't in the cards to be a professional but that skill that learned was the professional skill that i learned to take it into any business i want to do to yeah. anything i want to achieve to even in islam yeah. where it's like it's a work ethic it's a yeah. consistency praying yeah. five times a day every single day reading quran every day it's, it's a consistency yeah. but the more you do something the better you get at it as a whole so it's so awesome to hear how your story too kind of like it's so different yet so similar and synonymous with the improvement of you as an individual so that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. I think we went full circle, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Talking about some of the benefits of sport and how they, um, how it just develops us into the people we lo- we are and the yeah. people we become, you know. And, you know, that also being under the umbrella of what Allah has, has decreed for us, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Where, I want to ask you, what's like the best place or like your most, your favorite spot that you've like... Uh, performed or presented at like i know you said five different continents like it's awesome but it's like has there any spot that kind of like has like a little soft spot in your heart um i mean you know i would say the earlier experiences always have like a deeper impression on yeah you because it's a, it's a completely new experience mm-hmm. um so you know, what comes to mind is at the University of Pennsylvania, I was a part of a group called the Exelano Project mm-hmm. um, while I was actually playing college basketball. This was kind of like something I did on the, on the side. And um, we would perform basically twice a year. 
Um, but we would have our meetings monthly, weekly, biweekly kind of stuff. And we would kind of share in those circles. So I, th- I feel like when I first auditioned um, for the group, you know, it was like everything that I uh, did before that kind of built up to that moment. And mm-hmm. this was like the test now, like, yeah. am I good enough? Can I do it? You know, and just to give you a little bit of background, Exolano was uh, a, a spoken word poetry group that competed nationally. And while I was there, they placed third, second and first in the nation. Mm-hmm. Right. So high caliber talent, yeah. not just like, you know, uh, your average kind of poet, you know, I'm dabbling. Mm-hmm. No, it, this was like, serious. this yeah. is their thing. Yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of those uh, people that I, I learned from and, and shared that space with, they w- went on to become published authors, to become renowned poets, et cetera, you know. Um, and so when I tried out, that was like that moment of, of truth for me. It's like, am I good enough? You know, mm-hmm. um, so that that wasn't a big stage. You know, it was probably five other people in the room with me, mm-hmm. you know, but the moment was probably more memorable than some of the bigger stages that I've actually performed on uh, around the world. Um <sighs> So that that's the first thing that comes to mind, and then obviously performing through college in in that space, uh, on that on those stages with that group, um, was really the beginning of my performance career. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> over the U.S., I've performed uh, at a lot of the major conferences. Mm-hmm. I think ICNA fortieth uh, like annual conference down in, in Baltimore was a big one for me. So that was probably the biggest audience that I performed in front of. A mm-hmm. um, few years back now, maybe five, six years now, but you're talking ten, twelve thousand people. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was that was a big one. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome too because. You always hear it, like so many success stories of people who talk about their career, like what was their start or how they got into yeah. it. And people always say like the come up was so much fun. Like mm. people who are like successful now, it's like it's easy to say like, oh, of course we're saying the come up was the best part. <laughs> but like it's kind of true where it's like you really don't forget those first times where like you step on stage and you are so nervous and it's like I'm doing something so new and like mm. I'm doing this thing. Look at me, I'm doing this thing. And I can relate with that with just – um. I had like a there's like a pitch competition and I remember like being it's like I'm gonna be on live TV and I'm pitching and I'm talking about the company that I've thought about for the last three and a half years mm. and I'm sitting there like I'm a, usually a cool public speaker like nothing really yeah. gets me too nervous you know you'll feel your heart beating a little bit but okay you're, you can say what you need to say and I remember standing up there and I'm talking and like for a good like two seconds I just froze like m- mentally just froze looked at like this like my like my slide like because there's only one picture I took like a deep breath I was like. I like you see, you're, I was like living it a lot. I was like watching myself from a third person yeah, view. I, you. I was like, <laughs> this is actually happening. Like I, it was so like like strategic that I was like, I'm saying the little one minute pitch, one half minute pitch, and then the questions is the easy part for me. Yeah, I was yeah. talking to the judges. Yeah, yeah, natural. And I was like, oh my god, I am so nervous. Like I was like shaking internally, mm. but like I knew my voice sounded fine. <laughs> but those two seconds I froze I felt like ten years. Yeah, I was like, and then I started, and I went on and finished the, the talk. And I look back, I, t- I look back on it now, and I'm like, oh, it was a couple months ago, and I'm like, huh, like that was the start of me being able to be confident. And now when I go to like different places mm. or pitch or talk, I'm smooth and through, and it's easy, it's fun. People are coming up to me after, like, wow, you sound so confident, you're so ready, little ball. I'm like, it's weird that like that first one that was always gonna have like such a yeah, deep yeah, image. Sure. It's like first time on live TV, I'm like, I'm scared. I'm like, yeah. what am I supposed to do? What if I mess up? Mm. What if I slip? What if I this? What if I drop the mic? Like, all these things go on and it's like, you don't forget that like first yeah. experience. Um, I'm just remembering probably one of the best compliments that I got <clears throat> in college was after one of our kind of annual, uh, biannual shows. I think I was like Ivy League player of the year. Mm-hmm. I was like, for basketball, mm-hmm. I was like, uh, in the newspaper, like twice a week on campus, like you know, like big man on campus. Yeah, you felt there. Like yeah, this good feeling of like doing the thing. Uh, I mean, the feeling has nothing to do with it, but that was the situation, right? Yeah, yeah. Like 
that was my kind of status on campus. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, they had started selling my my basketball jersey in in the library, uh, the the school library, and this is like the first jersey they started selling mm-hmm. on campus. Period. They didn't do that before, mm-hmm. right? So like that was kind of my status. But then after this one spoken word poetry show we did. One of uh, the attendees of the event came up to me and she said, quit basketball. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you know, like, I'm like Ivy League player of the year. Oh, yeah. You, so you get like, it. So she's like, no, quit basketball. Keep doing the poetry thing. Like, you know. She saw the potential in you that you could be poetry person of the year energy. Kind of. In like sense that, of like, yeah. you don't even need to worry about basketball. Yeah. She saw this potential in you or greatness in you at the moment. She was like. This is even better than basketball for you. Yeah. That's that is a, that's definitely a sweet compliment, like you're saying. Especially yeah. like, that dichotomy. Of, like, <laughs> I just got like Ivy Player of the Year. It's like, but you're telling me to stop doing yeah. that and focus on the poetry. And back then, you know, I thought nothing of it. Like this person is exaggerating, right? Like, but over the years now, with the work that I've been able to do with the spoken word poetry. Um, I kind of reflect on that. It was like, you know, was Allah telling me something then? Yeah. You know, um, you know, and Allah knows best. But yeah. I love that. It's so, it's even for me, like, it's very inspirational because, like, like I was saying before, it's like when I was younger, it's like I was most talkative. I would never stop talking mm. to people. And it's like, fast forward, is it surprising that I enjoy doing things like being on stage and talking to people and sharing my message with, like, what I do for like my company and talking about it. And even the company itself is a voice social media platform where yeah. it's focused on talking and healing the bridge of what we see nowadays where Instagram is just these photos, superficial images, filters on Snapchat, mm. all these different things. And what I focused on was the realness of the talking to one another and how that's the most important thing. So then it's not crazy that Allah put those little things in my life, yeah. these skills or characteristics that mm. allowed me to do the thing. And then is it really surprising that it's like, oh, he has a podcast. Oh, of course, this guy never stopped talking. <laughs> so it's these little things like you're saying, like it's inspiring to hear like you say that as well where it's like it's so true like Allah literally will put things in your face or in your path you just have to be willing to trust your intuition and instinct and be like this is a message from Allah this is a guidance from Allah I always think about um, Moses Musa alayhi salam peace be upon him um, and his staff right Mm -hmm. before Allah used the staff to make wonders right Mm -hmm. to do miracles Musa was already using that yeah. thing, you know, and a stick, you know, is something that you wouldn't think, you know, Allah could or anyone could make use of it, you yeah. know, but no, Allah meets us where we are and he takes what we have and he makes good of it, mm-hmm. you know, so whatever you come to uh, Allah with, right, whatever you come to God with, he can make good use of it, mm-hmm. you know, and so I always ask my youth, you know, just working with the youth, what's your staff? What has, you know, Allah ingrained in you? What has he given you? What's unique about you that now he can take it and make good use of it, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so that's just something that I always always think about, you know. And for me, my staff has really become my pen, mm-hmm. you know, not just writing poetry, but, you know, developing curriculum mm-hmm. um, and, and writing books in other categories as well. You know, one thing that I'm very passionate about, and I didn't mention it in the beginning, but it is uh, number one on my list, and that is the Quran. Uh, The Book of Allah is something that uh, I've been really, really striving to connect to and keep that connection with over the years. And what really sparked that was that journey to Morocco. I mean, you know, I was always like interested in the Quran as a kid because it has this kind of majestic style, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, and there's this kind of like craze, right? Like whoever memorizes the most has like, you know, status and like, you know, it it just has this... um, there's like a glow, there's like an illustrious glow, glow and you know, it. presence yeah. and just like the reputation of it, you mm-hmm. know. So naturally, you, you wonder about it, you know. But really, when I went to Morocco and started to memorize a little bit, and you know, every morning after Fajr, we would recite it for, for an hour, you know. Um, that's when it kind of really, I internalized just the, the vibration, yeah. <laughs> you know, no, of true. the Quran. And yeah. It felt like it, it became a part of me, like I needed it 
more than ever, you know, just after that experience. And then uh, later on in life, just pursuing it more deeply, trying to study it, trying to understand it, you know, um, and understand its role, not just its meaning, but its role. You mm -hmm. know, this is guidance from above the seven heavens mm -hmm. and, and trying to now live up to it, you know. So just that journey with the Quran has really defined and shaped me and made me the person that I am, you know. And so when I do this, the youth work that I do, you know, I always try to incorporate the Quran mm -hmm. because the Quran has a, a sublime impact. Sometimes we don't realize, you know, what rehearsing these verses is actually doing to our hearts, mm -hmm. doing to our minds, you know, and how it's actually shaping us, right? The wife of the prophet Aisha, peace and blessings of Allah be upon her, she said that the character of the prophet was the Quran. Mm -hmm. Right. So literally this man that we follow, mm -hmm. you know, wassalam, he was shaped by the Quran. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, we always want to know the secret behind the man. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, Kobe Bryant, Mamba mentality, what made Kobe so great. Mm -hmm. Right. What made the Prophet wassalam, That's, yeah. so great? Why is he number one at the top of my, Michael Hart's list? Why did he accomplish what he did on the religious level and also on the secular level? Mm -hmm. Right? She's telling us that it was the Quran that shaped him into the man that he became. Mm -hmm. Right? And so his transformation started from the very beginning of the revelation. Right, where he was an unlettered man, didn't know how to read or write, didn't have the access to the scripture. And then, boom. Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent down the revelation that transformed him and it transformed his entire society, mm -hmm. you know. And for me, as a person who's striving for completion, and I feel like this is something that's innate for all of us. Like, when we have inadequacies, when we have deficiencies, we want to kind of like get out of those deficiencies. Yeah. We don't want to kind of like lay down and just, you know, mm -hmm. let it be, yeah. you know, and this is what drives us in sports, right? Like, ah, man, my left hand is weak. I need to really like strengthen my left hand or my jump shot is weak or, you know, my soccer, my, my passing, my vision, my understanding of the game is weak, right? So we're not comfortable with that as human beings. Yeah. Naturally, right? We want to improve. We want to become we want, better. Yeah. We want to uh, attain mastery and completion, mm -hmm. you know, some things I don't feel about, uh, I don't feel comfortable about not being able to grow my own food. Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable about not being able to do certain things that would allow me to be entirely independent mm -hmm. from, from everyone and like everything. Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency, right? Except the creator, yeah. right? So I'm not comfortable with that. And these are things that, you know, I think about often, you know, is that I want to strive and reach a level of, of completion. And so I feel like... The Quran specifically, you know, provides that that kind of roadmap to attain uh, completion and also self sufficiency, you know. And so that's something that I'm I'm always reading. I'm always reflecting about the Quran. I'm always trying to incorporate it into my life and also uh, my work as well. Mm -hmm. and it's really interesting too because, like, even when I remember going through my like, I guess my spiritual journey, right? Okay. Where you go from <laughs> obviously, like, when alhamdulillah, if you're born. Muslim, you also have to kind of become Muslim though, because like mm. given Islam is like, oh, like, mom, Baba, pray. Okay, I pray with Baba. Okay, okay, yeah. I'll pray with you. Like you're not thinking when you're you're yeah. you're ten, like how important it is. You're not when I'm fifteen fasting. Yeah. I'm not understanding the the deep meaning behind the fast as much as I do now, ten years later. Mm. So then I'm thinking, okay, when I went through this big spiritual change, it was so funny because. What happened first was I got like spiritual, right? Where it's like you start realizing that gratitude is so important and like the concept of the words you tell yourself, the mm. positive affirmations that mm. nowadays is like such a hot topic that people always talk about. And I started thinking like, what are these positive affirmations mean? When you say Bismillah before you drink water, mm. you're saying in the name of God before you drink water. So yeah. it's like, again, you're escorting Allah for the water. Yeah, you're saying in the Allah. name of God, you're thinking of God before yeah. I drink. And then after, Alhamdulillah, thank yeah. God. So, so we're thanking the creator of this water. Mm. So then there's that constant gratitude. So I started thinking, okay, how close are these people who are just saying it spiritually and they're calling it the universe, but we call it Allah. Mm. And I'm noticing like all these different things where I'm like, hmm, like 
the spiritual aspect is what will improve me. And if I speak positively about myself, if I believe that I can achieve this thing, then I can do this, I can do that. And then the more I read the Quran, and the mm. Quran is literally the number one, it's like, like you said, the best self-help book you can ever buy. <laughs> you know, it's, and it, gives you, sure. like, it just gives you game. And like the whole time you're thinking, the Quran isn't just rules. It's 97% ethics and values and morals and guidance. The 3% of it is like rules where it's like, don't do this, don't do that. But people tend to think like, oh, it's the Quran or the Bible. It's all just rules, rules, rules. But religion mm. in and of itself, it's a way of life. And I think that's something that I've like, I noticed too, like in how you spoke about it. It's like the Quran really, it makes sense as to how like Aisha has said, like, it's this character came directly from this book. Yeah. And then when you read the book, like you're saying, you re- you start feeling it. You start hitting yeah. it. It's like hits heart in your heart. You know, it's it, it cleans the imperfections and the impurities of our heart. So I kind of like how you like mentioned that as well. So yeah. Um, and I feel like um, just like you said, I don't know the percentages. You know, for like what is uh, the rulings, what mm-hmm. is halal and haram, what is permissible and impermissible, and you know, but w- a few verses in the Quran just always, you know, kind of like stay in the front of my mind. Um, one of them is in Surah uh, the chapter of Isra, the Ascension, where he says, "Indeed, this Quran guides to that which is most virtuous." Mm-hmm. Right, so it's driving us to what's aqwam, which is like superlative virtue, not yeah. just like yeah. mediocre, mid kind of virtue, yeah. but the, you highest know, level. the highest level of virtue. And so the Prophet Sallam, obviously, he had the the best character, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, there, he's the proof of of that particular verse. And there's another verse that says that all that we convey to you from the stories. Stories, there's so many stories in the Quran, right? Is there to strengthen your heart, to give you resolve, you know? So when you go out into the world and you face similar situations, similar tests, or you witness similar things, then you kind of have a roadmap of how to to act. But also those sentiments, they they lingering inside your heart when you read stories of the powerful versus the powerless and your heart is inclining towards the powerless. Right. And then you go out into the world and you see a similar situation, then you're going to start inclining towards the powerless. Right. That empathy is being kind of stimulated. Right. And, and sparked inside of the heart when you're rehearsing those particular stories. So that's why I say it has a sublime impact. You know, the transformation, mm-hmm. sometimes we don't even know it. It's like, yeah. why did you do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know why I did that. Right. But it may have been some imp- influence that, you know, just from reading, you know, one of the stories of the Quran. Yeah. And it's it's funny because I, I can remember it is I've prayed like the Doha prayer this morning. And I was like, oh, let me say Doha, obviously. But then I as I was writing, you know, how it's like you'll have like this focus and like randomly a thought will like fly by your head. Mm. And one of those like random thoughts that did fly by my head at the point was like, Wow, like this surah was given to the prophet, mm. like when he was like down bad, right? Yeah, and yeah. He didn't have a revelation come to him for a while, and he's like, "Yo, like, where's revelation at?" You know. But then it's like it, that was the surah that came, and then the message behind that story, mm. why that was revealed, how the prophet peace be upon him went through that struggle, where it's like he felt like he had done wrong to yeah. done wrong, or what is it? And then even in that, like the beauty behind it, it's like it heals depression. And then I started thinking, like, when I was in a really bad spot in my life, I was like, let me memorize this surah. Like, let me make mm. sure I know the surah front and end and actually understand it. And then, alhamdulillah, like, I got into a better spot. But then I started thinking, why did that help? Or why is it helping? And it's like mm. those deeper meanings behind every line, every verse, exactly. every intricacy in, like, the Arabic language and why you feel that. Even, like, I remember, like, in the zalzala, right, like the earthquake. It's like yeah. talking about, like, and for someone who does, like, any good, any amount of good, it's like it's... It's Allah will see that good. Mm. So it's like, don't think that because I do something good or something this or I ask Allah for forgiveness or or you're going to struggle that Allah doesn't see that. Mm. But then, like you said, look back on the stories of all the different, like Musa, Yusuf, yeah. Isa. You know, you see all these stories where it's like, or belly of the whale. Like mm. all these different stories that are given that are like, oh, snap. Like they was going through it. But then what do they rely back onto that got him out? Yeah. And it was Allah. Yeah. And it was the revelation. So it's awesome to see like the... It's like, don't just read a story like, oh, that's a cool story. Nice. Yeah. It's like, implicate, like, take that into your own life and think, how can I take this story and then inspire my own life, my mm. own actions? Um, I just had a passing thought. Um, there's, there's really like, 
you know, extreme contrast between um, people who have internalized the realities of the Quran, the, the meanings of the verses, and those who have not. I remember a few years ago, I did a khutbah in um, New Jersey, a sermon, um, and I met a young man after the sermon, and he's like, uh, can I have your number, right? And, um, you know, he seemed a little, like, socially awkward, kind of person Mm -hmm. and um he actually called me like the next day and he was like i'm struggling like bad you know i'm going through it i feel like nobody likes me like you know he's basically considering suicide Mm -hmm. and he started to say things about allah won't forgive me and you know i'm such a bad person and then how can i you know ever come out of this situation and i asked him well, what is that thought based on? Like, that Allah won't forgive you. Have you read that somewhere? And he was like, no. And I was like, no, rather Allah says, right, that whoever repents to him and uh, uh, follows that up with faith and good deeds, then Allah not only will forgive this person, but he will turn their bad deeds into good deeds. All right, and I kind of start reframing his mindset in mm-hmm. that moment, right? He hadn't internalized the verses. He he had only made assumptions about Allah that were not founded. Mm-hmm. And so when I helped him kind of internalize those verses, like somebody who's late, basically on the phone in tears is now hanging up the phone refreshed. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. just by internalizing a few verses of the Quran, yeah. not even the whole book. I was say not even a lot of verses, <laughs> right? like a very specific sentence. But look where he was. He was like on edge, you know, because he was disconnected mm-hmm. more so than anything else. Like, yeah, there's certain things, you know, socially that, you know, he's still going to be challenged with in his life. Right. But the thing that would actually help him get through those challenges is internalizing verses. That's why Allah says in Surah Al-Kaf, you know, how can you be patient? How can you persevere through that which you have no knowledge about? Yeah. You know what I mean? The yeah. knowledge is what anchors you in the middle, in the midst of the storm, mm-hmm. right? But if you don't have that, then you're going to come to your own conclusions. Maybe the, the whispers are going to come in. From and the assumptions. The, and the assumptions, right? Based on maybe what you see on TV, what you hear in music, et cetera, right? Just like what whatever's out there, mm-hmm. right? And so that's why the Quran is like the, the, the trustworthy handhold. If you yeah. hold on to it firmly, right, it's going to uh, protect you and keep you anchored. You yeah. Know? But I know you have more questions for me, no, man. No, of course. <laughs> you know, I just love it because even when it comes to Islam, like, it's it's nice for even me to have this conversation where it's like you're never – it's a never-ending journey of learning and understanding and trying to get there yeah. deeper. And even then, it's like I'm inspired. I'm thinking, yo, next time I, I listen to some Quran on you know, YouTube, I open some Quran, I'm going to really, like, deeply think yeah, of each yeah, line, yeah. like why that line was given but to, for us, yeah. from us – to us from Allah and even when it comes down to like the little verse in the Quran like one of my favorite one like su- like verses into it in uh, an Ankabut like the spider where mm-hmm. it really talks about like how we build this life for ourselves and we think we're so this and strong and powerful but mm-hmm. it's like the way we think of how our decree for our life is is like how we look at like the spider web how it's so intricate in design but one little whoosh, and, and it's, it's gone. done so then it's like how intricate we try to design our lives and think, oh, I'm going to do this and this and I do this. Da, da, da. But all of it is through Allah. And then within the beginning of that surah, it literally says how like if you say you're a believer, like surely you're going to be tested. Mm. So it's when you say you believe in God, you understand that God is the divine. God has all these attributes and traits that are given to us and taught and teaches us from the Quran. So then if you're going to get tested from these things that Allah is going to give you, then you look back onto the stories that Allah also shows you to get yeah. through those same struggles that he might give you. Yeah. So then it's like how amazing it is. And even we look at the prophet, like you said, again, orphan. All, all like the like the struggles he went through in his life mm. constantly, even having children die, all these different things. And like all these different struggles, you're like, wow, one man dealt with all that struggle, but then the Quran made him this character. It's like yeah. such like a harmonious relationship of like understanding when you like start piecing together. Piecing it together, yeah. So no, I love that. But I wanted to ask you, just talking about thinking about family and stuff, is you said that family is again like a big passion, having a family and doing those things and raising righteous children, how much of a blessing that is. What has changed in your deen or akhlat or islam from since like before having kids and after having kids? <clears throat> Um, the person that I am 
today and the places that I that I am today are because of my my kids. When you have kids, you uh, stop really making decisions primarily for yourself, and you start making decisions for the well being of your family. Mm-hmm. You know, and I always say that a person's consciousness of God has to expand as soon as he uh, gets married, right? So now I'm not just responsible uh, for one person, right? But I'm responsible for for two, right? And then once you have children, it has to continue to expand and expand and expand, you know? So just your mindfulness uh, and your dutifulness, right? Uh, Your sense of responsibility and accountability expands and you have to expand in order to keep up with all of that, right? Mm-hmm. And so you transform naturally by becoming a, a, a husband or a wife. You transform naturally by becoming a parent. Um, <clears throat> and you start to make decisions and moves in life, right, accordingly. You know, when I um, left basketball, it was literally a few weeks after my son was born. And I had a conversation with my wife, like, I don't really want my son to come into this arena mm-hmm. because they're playing the the music, and especially in Europe, they're not even censoring it, right? They're playing American music. Yeah. They don't know sometimes what it's saying, mm-hmm. but I know what it's saying, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, they have the dancers, they have the alcohol, they have the gambling, like everything you can imagine, it's in that arena. They yeah. have the, the kiss cam, yeah. right? And the kids are kind of just absorbing this stuff, mm-hmm. right? Allah gives us our children pure, and it's our responsibility that not to corrupt their purity. Mm-hmm. They ultimately, once they become accountable, they have to maintain their own purity through prayer, through fasting, through charity, through repentance. All of those things are there so that we return to Allah pure. Yeah. Right? So my responsibility kicks in as a parent as well. So I'm like, I don't feel comfortable bringing him into this space, into this arena. Mm-hmm. Which means ultimately that my wife can't come either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? And so I had to take a step back and say, okay, should I be here? Can I be here? You know? And it wasn't a thing about maintaining my religious identity for myself at that point. You know, when I was uh, trying out for the Houston Rockets, they used to call me Scarf Daddy, mm-hmm. right? Because I used to come in there with my kafia around my neck every day, mm-hmm. I, you know, different colors, mm-hmm. right? The kafia king, the kafia king, right? Yeah. One of my old nicknames, right? Yeah. So I didn't have a problem at that phase of just identifying and representing as a Muslim, mm-hmm. you know, but it was now my concern is for my offspring. And then that ultimately inspired me to leave that space, Mm -hmm. right? When my son turns four, and maybe I was a little bit ahead of the game, I said, okay, I want them to learn Arabic. I don't want them to have to go back how I did and have to learn Arabic Mm -hmm. um, and struggle. You know, I want them to get that experience early where it's natural, it's easy, right? So we said, okay, let's move to Egypt. <laughs> we got up and left. Dahya <laughs> Masr. Yeah, right. Went to Umad Dunya. Umad Dunya. Right? We stayed there for three and a half years, mm-hmm. right? So that they could get uh, their Islamic identity embedded in them while they were young, you know? So I'm making those decisions based on their benefit now. Mm-hmm. When I chose to come to Allentown and be the youth director, the first question is Is this a good environment for my family? Mm hmm. Right. Is this a space that I can control within the U.S.? Right. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you can be exposed to so much without even trying. Just driving here. Right. Billboard on my right. Billboard on my left. Right. The things that are being sold, the things that are being advertised. Yeah. Right. Just, you know, make you cringe sometimes. Like, how is this on even on a billboard? How is this even allowed? Who's behind this? You know. And so. Can I control this space enough where I'm going to be the I'm going to be able to have the dominant narrative in the life of my children, Mm -hmm. you know, at least until um, they've reached that age of accountability and responsibility that I know that I've done everything in my capacity to give them the guidance, give them their rights, you know, um, and set them on the right path, you know, so. Like, you know, we homeschool. <laughs> yeah. Homeschooling is not not easy, mm-hmm. you know. 
um, for, for so many different reasons, right? But again, I have a sense of responsibility there and a sense of accountability that I don't want to just put them in any space. You know, I don't want them, I don't want to subject them to things that I was subjected to when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. You know, um, and I don't want to pass off my responsibility to somebody else mm -hmm. and say, oh, I entrusted somebody else with this responsibility. You know, no, I want to. As a man, I feel, again, talking about completion, right? I feel like this is my responsibility. And a part of my completion of my manhood is that I take up my responsibilities as much as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't just defer and defer and defer, but I do what I can in my own capacity first. Yeah. Right? So we're in the homeschooling phase, you know. So, so much about me and who I am is because of my children. My father always says... Uh, I can't remember the quote, but something of the nature of, you know, parents, um, you know, oftentimes are praised for the children they raise. Mm -hmm. But really, the, the children do so much to raise the parents, right? Yeah. To make the parents have to step up to the challenge and become, you know, who they become as parents because now they have children, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like even so beautiful because I know it's like um, we believe that like kids bring risk to you it's like mm. risk isn't just wealth or money but it's also like <laughs> it's like status and your deed and like your discipline and it's so awesome to hear you say like the responsibility and the accountability yeah. that you gained it's yeah. like yo i gotta be accountable for like yeah. not just me but my wife oh now there's a kid we hold up why am i gonna bring this kid where he can hear all this buffoonery and see this and the cheerleaders and, uh, and what am i gonna expose this this kid to that it's so moldable yeah. by what they see around them no. like kids don't like it's so funny like kids don't like learn things as as what's like i'll go to school do this do that but that's why it's like parents care so much like who are your friends who are you talking to after yeah. class who's gonna shape you and it's like yeah. you say like driving around nowadays i'll see things like billboards or ads or this or that or even when you're on the phone or do you see like a sponsored post it's like why are, are they trying to sell me toothpaste with a woman who's half naked yeah. it's like why is that an advertisement it's like why yeah. am i seeing a toothpaste ad like that and it, it baffles me and i'm like yeah. Sex huh? sells, right? That's and you see that, and you get things like, "Oh, like I want to do this. Like, if I have kids, inshallah, I want to be able to protect them from that to keep, like you said, that innocence, their purity." Yeah. And it's so awesome to hear like someone say it that way, where it's like the kids also, in a sense, raise the parents too, where it's like makes them kind of boss up, like, "Oh, it's not, <laughs> like I gotta be. If I'm the leader of the ship, or I'm the captain of the ship, yeah. then if I go right, they're gonna go right with me." If I go left, they're going left with me, and yeah. they have to trust, and they trust me. So then I have to be someone that's worth being trusted. So I love like that yeah. kind of energy that you have with it. Yeah, each of you are a shepherd. Every one of you is a shepherd, and he will be asked about their their flock. You know, so that's something that's definitely you know pressing on me um, all the time. Are they getting the right education? Are we doing the right things to raise them? Are we feeding them properly? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these kids, they have no filter and they have no barrier and they can just eat whatever they want. And, you know, they go even to the masjid and they get big bags of basically sugar, mm -hmm. you know. Like the fast foods and the different things. And they already had a bag earlier. <laughs> so there's no, you know, uh, even like restrictions, you know. Mm -hmm. And... A lot of that stuff impacts behavior, mm -hmm. definitely impacts health. Yeah. Um, you talk about just uh, pre-diabetes being a decade or more, you know, earlier yeah. now in our time than it used to be, you know, just yeah. you know, a decade ago, you mm -hmm. know. So trying to pay, to pay attention to, to a lot of things, you know, and having five children, each of them having different personalities, each of them having different needs, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot to keep track of at times, you know, but it definitely pushes you you know and at the end of the day because of the the strain and the difficulty you have the the greater fulfillment at the end of the day like you know that yeah. sense of relief like we did it right mm -hmm. um it's different you know having the championship uh in the first year um as opposed to having it in the second year after suffering like a loss yeah you know what i mean mm -hmm. it, it's much sweeter after you've tasted the difficulty and, and the process and you've fallen down and gotten back up you're going to appreciate that a lot more than someone who just has it given to them in the very beginning you know yeah. so i appreciate the process you know but yeah it could be challenging at times no i love that and it's so cool again like how that like translates to where it's like 
even when you look at the stories, like we were saying, you look at the sports, all these different things where it's like when you go through the struggle, you go through the hardship, like when you do finally taste that fruit, when you finally mm-hmm. grow that your own food and you have your <laughs> first strawberry, your first Coming thing, soon, coming you know soon. I mean? So then you're thinking like, <laughs> wow, like after all that knowledge, the learning, the things yeah. to that, the adapting to all these different barriers and obstacles and then to finally have like a sense of little bit of victory, just even if it's a small victory, yeah. it just feels so good because yeah. of the fact that it's like as human beings, we're inclined to not only a worship, right? We worship something, whether it be sometimes nowadays people worship money, people worship their status, mm-hmm. da, 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 da. but we, obviously we worship Allah. So, hey, okay, that's in check. Next, okay, once I get here, I have an inclination then to improve myself. Okay, once I improve myself and I see small little marginal goals where yeah. someone's like, oh, yo, dude, you look great. Oh, hey, dude, you've lost weight. Or, hey, dude, you've done... Someone notices. You're like, oh, because I've been disciplined for this year, two years, three years. Yeah. So then you have that. Then you're like, okay, now what? It's like yeah. you got caught up in this thing. And I just feel like with having kids even nowadays, like you were saying with health and fitness, it just kind of made me think about this where it's like people nowadays don't even realize like the crap that's in the food, like the modern, mm-hmm. the modern food. And like yeah. I tell people, like I haven't eaten like any like McDonald's, Burger Kings or any of that stuff in years and years and years. And I tell people like it wasn't that hard to remove. And after I removed it, I realized like, oh my God, like I was eating some like crap when I was younger. Like yeah. that wasn't making me a better athlete, a spiritual person. And nowadays people learn about their gut microbiome and how important your gut is. And if your gut is unhealthy, it, it affects your serotonin levels, your yeah. dopamine levels, how you handle anxiety yeah. and stress, how you feel, your hyperactivity, all these different things, yeah, all like yeah. the extra dyes and things where I can't pronounce this thing that's in the ingredient of this. <laughs> Red 40, huh? Right? You know what I mean? If you can't, if you don't know what it is, <laughs> then you probably shouldn't be eating it. And it's all those things like, but my one friend was just telling me, he was like, I just bought bread from the farmer's market. And he's like, okay, I bought this bread. And on like the bread, they were saying like, these are the five ingredients in here. Yeah. Like, Sugar, flour, water, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And he was like, I bought her for like, obviously I know my family to eat, but usually like they're going to see their classic white bread versus yeah, yeah. the bread he had. And he was, I was like, he was like, I was halfway through it, but then it lasted three days until I started seeing mold on it. And he was like three days in, I was like, I saw mold on the bread. And I was like, dang, like my bread's starting to get moldy. But then that white bread was there a week before. Mm. And so a week before, and then he looked at it, it had no mold on it. So he was like, what are they putting in that bread to preserve it? That's yeah. not needing to, to be put in your body. Because whatever that is put into that bread to preserve it is then going into your body. Yeah. Because like the natural bread went bad after three, four days. He's like, it made me realize like you shouldn't have this sense of gluttony where you're storing all this bread or all this food. Mm. You should kind of eat in moderation and consumption of like fresh all the time. Yeah. And I started thinking about it more and I was like, huh, like that's again another concept where it's like, what are we putting in our bodies? Why yeah. aren't we doing that more often? Yeah, everything in moderation, it, it would require really yeah, a real dynamic shift, right, for mm-hmm. everybody to kind of get on the organic, mm-hmm. natural uh, path. And even myself, I struggle because I wasn't raised like that. You know, I, mm-hmm. you know, we grew up going to these restaurants and eating from the the candy store and all of that. You know, so I'm still uh, growing that way. But at least you know, my wife has the consciousness uh, to try to give our children better than than what we were conscious mm-hmm. of when we were younger you yeah know, give them that consciousness and sometimes we have our quote-unquote cheat days or you mm-hmm. know it's hard when you know everybody's running around with ice cream and, and your kids don't eat that or you know to kind of you know keep them uh stable emotionally at times you know mm-hmm. feeling like they're being left out or they're missing out on something you know but we have the positive alternatives available you know but sometimes we, we say okay go ahead you know? yeah um because there's other ways that you can also uh balance the health out afterwards mm-hmm. detoxing and stuff like that exactly uh, yeah no that's so important and i kind of love that too because again when you have to, like you said, worry about, like, for me, say if I'm just worried about my health, my fitness, my this, super easy. Yeah. But then when you have five other people to worry about, <laughs> you're like, oh, stop. Now I got to really be yeah. an example because kids f- learn by watching their example. For sure. And if their example is, okay, what does dad eat? Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, dad's eating ice cream. Why yeah. can't I eat ice cream? Oh, <laughs> dad's, but, okay, dad's eating a salad. Okay, so I'll eat with dad. Or it's like, there's that thing where then yeah. you have to be so disciplined on yourself or it's harder yeah. for you then to have your own cheat day yeah. or your own experience when you have to make sure you're the example for. Yeah, you're the primary people. example, but, you know, once they get to a, a certain age, um, the influence kind of shifts, uh, I want to say laterally, 
<laughs> so vertically, you know, you're, you're the parents are the, the primary influence, but it kind of shifts vertically. So what are their friends doing? What are their mm-hmm. classmates doing? What are their teammates doing? That's what they start to be influenced by, mm-hmm. you know. And so if you don't get ahead of the game early, yeah. you know, you could lose that battle mm-hmm. as a parent very easily. And we, I see that a lot as a youth worker. Parents have lost that, that battle because they waited too late to kind of set the tone and and be that model in Mm -hmm. the household. And then they come to me with the 16-year-old or the 17-year-old, and they're like, hey, fix him. Yeah. You know, fix her. You know, and it's like, what do you want me to do? Like, wave a a wand and you think, okay, he's going to come back fixed. No. If this took 10 years to build up, it's not going to just take 10 minutes to fix. Yeah, because it was ingrained now. Now something's yeah. become ingrained into their lifestyle. So to remove it, it's going to take time, yeah. effort, pressure. Teaching, experience. Yeah. I mean, like you said, the the person um, has a life experience that brings them to a point of humility where now they're ready to accept the uh, reality for what it is. You know, mm-hmm. So there's certain things that have to take place sometimes to do the unteaching. The mm-hmm. person just might not be ready anymore. Yeah. You know, they were ready 10 years ago. They were ready, you know, 15 years ago. But right now they've come to a place where they're not ready to hear that, mm-hmm. you know? Do you think that it's, so like, obviously, you know, like the saying, it's like, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Like, do you think that there's an age or a gap or a level of like, say, open-mindedness in one's life where you can change? And if so, like, how often do you think people do change in certain aspects? So, for example, like you're saying, a 15-year-old. How long do you think it would take, say, a 15-year-old or 20-year-old to start changing versus someone who's 50, 55, or 40 even to start changing? Do you think there's a difference? Or do you think that with the older you get and the more you're doing the quote-unquote wrong or long, wrong lifestyles, that it's significantly harder? Or is it easier because they have life experience? I think there's always exceptions to the rule. Mm-hmm. So I think generally speaking, you can't teach an old dog new tricks is uh, more about um, keeping up with education and keeping up with, with trends, right? Like social media, for example, you yeah. put that in the hand of a 50-year-old or a 60-year-old, it's going to be something completely foreign to them. And they're going to be like, what's this button for? Where the, the six-year-old already knows how to... S- s- you know, Mm -hmm. scroll and and swipe and get whatever he wants on on the phone, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's an educational aspect to that is where, you know, sometimes you kind of like outgrow, you know, um, or have outgrown or outlived, you know, your time. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, now let the young people take it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. But I also think like the Prophet, you know, he was 40 when he received Revelation. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, that's so a great example, yeah. That that journey began at forty, you know, and it lasted until uh, almost his mid sixties, right? Mm-hmm. So sixty three years old, twenty three or a little under twenty three years of, of revelation, and all of that was transformation. All of that was learning, and many of his companions, right, were older, his, yeah. his senior or mm-hmm. you know his peers, right? And so, how much did they learn? You know, so. Um, I would say there's always exceptions to the rules, mm-hmm. you know, especially when it comes to seeking Allah, religion, you know, people memorize the Quran, for example, just, you know, more than 600 pages, more than 6,000 verses, you know, as, as elders, mm-hmm. you know, some people would think, no, this is impossible. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? This is for the younger people with the fresher mind, you know? So there's always going to be the exception to the rules. Um, I think... You know, approach is important, mindset is important, and also having the divine approval, you yeah. know, uh, above all of that is important. No, I love that answer. So I kind of want to ask you, like, going off of, again, like, life and time and everything, like, where do you see the world going in five years? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a matter of the unseen. Mm-hmm. Um, the world is definitely an interesting place in my own life. I've seen really dynamic shifts, probably uh, a type of rapid change mm-hmm. that hasn't really happened, you know, over the the centuries, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, when I was a kid, there was something called Atari. I don't know if you ever yeah, heard yeah. of Atari. Mm-hmm. Then came, like, Nintendo, like the, the first Nintendo, the two buttons. 
Super Nintendo, Sega, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, my parents uh, grew up in Jim Crow South, mm -hmm. you know, segregated South. Uh, they used to listen to the radio like television, like what, you know, we call television. Yeah. You know, they saw black and white TV, you know. Mm -hmm. But this is just 50 years of evolution. Yeah. Social media um, came out when I was a freshman in college. Facebook started when I was a freshman in college, you know. Mm -hmm. So the world has been rapidly transforming, you know, over the last few decades, you know. And I think that's the pace that we're going now, you know. Yeah. Um, and just even looking at social media, how saturated it has become over the last five years. Mm -hmm. You know, it was almost like a new thing um, just a decade ago. It was like, you know, yeah. is this thing going to take off? Is it really any value in it? You know, and now, um, like, even when I, I started actually sharing my poetry online, it was just like three of us, like three, four poets, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But now everybody has a platform. Everybody's uh, putting out mm -hmm. content. You know? Yeah, the barrier of entry is so low now. It's it? all you need is a phone. <laughs> yeah, you, know? you know, it wasn't like that before, right? So the technology has moved it forward as well. You know, and now with the introduction of of AI, mm -hmm. you know, and and technology that's going to be surrounding that, you know, it's very very difficult to say where uh, the world is going. You know, and, and what the future holds, only Allah, he really he really knows. You know, yeah. we can say, oh, doomsday, Armageddon, you yeah. know. Minor uh, signs and everything. World War Three, World War Four. you know, we can say these things, but only Allah really knows, you know, um, what, what's to come. You mm -hmm. know, if you would go back to the time of the Prophet, والسلام, when people were burying their daughters alive, you know, and, and worshiping stones, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. the, and guidance was was less the time before the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam yeah. was actually raised up as a as a prophet right there was no guidance i mean there was you know just scraps mm -hmm. you know people were you know scholars of uh the the people of the scripture were were dying off and they were waiting for the arrival of a prophet you know yeah. so imagine that time you know at least in this time we have the quran preserved Mm -hmm. We have the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, available yeah. to us, you know. We have the knowledge, we have yeah. everything given to us, but it's so funny. I always tell people, like, now we have all this knowledge, but we also have an excess of all this other knowledge, and yeah. all stuff that's, or this other content, information example, that can distract you from the yeah. main thing. So it's like, it's like the double edged sword, or it's like less, less and less things yeah. besides, and no less guidance versus. Everything under the moon, the sun, the stars, yeah. and the guidance. So it's like understanding how to filter out all like the nonsense and just really focusing on yeah. the righteous things. Yeah. So, you know, um, we shouldn't have a doomsday kind of mentality because mm -hmm. I feel like that paralyzes you. Where yeah. It's like, oh, you know, the world is, is doomed and, you know, in a few years it's going to all be over. Like, what does that produce in yourself? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, we should keep close the hereafter in our mind that my hour <laughs> yeah. could be any time, right? Mm -hmm. My moment can be any time. And uh, having that mindset would produce uh, produce work, mm -hmm. right? Like motivate you to get things done, to mm -hmm. prepare yourself for that, that moment. So yeah. when the man came to the prophet and he asked him, when is the, the hour? He said, well, have you prepared for, for it? it? You yeah. know what I mean? Because that's the most important thing. You know, and he said, if the the hour was about to actually happen, and I'm paraphrasing, and you had a seed in your hand, right, you should plant, plant. that seed, yeah. you know, so it's about being productive. And I think sometimes when you think, oh, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow, it takes you away from what's happening right now today. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I be a factor right now? Right now. What's, how can I make the most of this moment right now? Mm -hmm. No, I love that answer. And it's so cool to hear, like how people nowadays will always look, like you said, like into the future, this, but it's like, okay, so if I see where I think the world's going in five years yeah. or what could happen, but what's happening right now, and if this keeps happening the way it is now, yeah. every day in five years, if this keeps happening, then let me be the change of 
this situation. Okay, this is happening right now, and it's I think it's inherently negative. Okay, let me be the change with this thing. Okay, so that's not like you said. Yeah. Like it's so saturated, right? Where all these people, everyone produces content. It's so easy yeah. to produce content, but it's like one of the things that like held me back for a while was like, oh, there's so much content. There's so much this. Mm. Like, uh, then I was like, you know what? Wait, time out. People post and do anything all they want, but to good positive content, to talk about righteous things, to yeah. give good advice, good disciplines, and upload things. You know what? That's a good thing, even yeah. if it won't get the views and the clickbaits and yeah. whatever. But if it's good quality thing, it's like that's your sense of Tao. That's your sense of giving something to the world that mm. lasts after you're gone. Yeah. So it's like that's the right mentality to have. And I started thinking of it that way, the way you kind of saying it's like, all right, let me get to work, right? Yeah. Let me inspire myself to get things done. Yeah. Oh, you want to write this? You want to do this book? You want to do this? Da, 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 da. Write it all down. Write your goals out. And like in Islam, it's, we're taught to have goals. Yeah. We're taught to have vision for what you want to achieve. And like you said, like the plant the tree. It's like right there. You have to yeah. plant it. Even if you might not sit underneath its shade, it's mm. like you still got to plant that tree. And it's one of those things where it's like, it shows you where it's like how you said, like when you have kids, it's like you're thinking of others, right? Not just yourself. Same thing where it's like, I'm will plant this tree. I might not sit underneath the shade, but you get Salah Jaria for it for every time an animal sits underneath its shade. Mm. A kid sits underneath its shade. It covers this. It does that. So it's like the right mentality. So I kind of yeah. just loved your answer there. And one of the questions I always ask is, um, what's a word you want to look in? You want to learn in Arabic? And you said epic. Oh. <laughs> and I kind of laughed because I was like, epic. Like epic is like a deep word, but it's like, in Egyptian slang Arabic, we would say ra'ah. Yeah. Like if something's ra'ah, it's, it's like, like superb. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's, it's banging. It's yeah, ra'ah. Yeah, yeah. It's stunning. It's like yeah. epic. Because like some of the translations directly for epic, almost like didn't understand the phrasing the of phrasing epic. The phrasing of it, right? Yeah. You know what I mean, so I think ra'ah is like the number one way I thought of for <laughs> Arabic. Yeah. And um, one of the things that you um, talked about was one of your favorite quotes, and I would love for you to share your favorite quote. So actually, um, one of my favorite quotes, and I probably have too many to mention. As a poet, yeah, it makes sense. Um, <laughs> um, one of my Arabic teachers in Egypt, um, he had uh, messaged me on one of the Eats, and um, he messaged me before I got to message him. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you beat me, sabaqtani, right? Like, you, mm -hmm. you beat me, right? And he said, uh, uh, he said, it's not about who uh, does the action first. Mm -hmm. right? Whoever was truthful and genuine and authentic and sincere about the action, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that, that stuck with me because um, sincerity obviously is, is the core of our, our religion. Nothing is accepted without sincerity, you know. Mm -hmm. So it reminded me uh, of many things, right? Because there's so many levels and layers to this particular quote, um, but that no matter what we do, right, even if we're first, even if we're, we're last, that's not the measuring stick. Yeah. The measuring stick is, was it genuine? Was yeah. it sincerely for the face of your Lord? Mm -hmm. You know, so um, that's, that's something that kind of just echoes, you know, in everything that I do mm -hmm. is... You know, you know, I feel as a poet um, that I could be doing a lot. I could be doing a lot more. And mm -hmm. there's uh, other poets out there um, and other artists out there that are probably doing more than I am that perhaps don't have the experience, don't have the actual drive to make sure that the content is completely authentic and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, kind of just, you know, so... And they're out there, right? Um, and I feel that I could be out there probably, you know, even more based on what Allah has blessed me with, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, I'm not anxious. Yeah. Right? Because for me, I feel that Allah has a time for me. He mm -hmm. has a moment for me, you know, if he wants that in the first place. Yeah. You know what I mean? So for me, it helps me not be distracted by what other people are doing because it's so easy to have. compare and yeah. think and yeah yeah you know um and so it, it keeps me grounded it keeps me focused on here and now you know and just making like i said before maximizing on the moment that i'm in mm -hmm. but also making sure that I want it, whatever I want, it's for the sake of Allah. A lot of times we just, we want this and we want that, right? And and we chase after it. And at the end of the day, it may be of no value to us if we didn't mm -hmm. do it with the proper intention. You yeah. Know? 
Um, but you had a comment on it that, that actually took it to another angle, right? Mm -hmm. um, that you text me. What? Well, oh, the, like the, 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 like the mission. The it was like the mission or something like that, right? Or Because um, the way my, when I was like looking it up and then the way my mom described it, it's like the one who's like, it's better to do something. It's like, it's better not to be first, but to do it genuinely, like right, correctly. It's yeah. like doing it the right way. Yeah. So it's it made me think even after where like I ended up speaking with someone. It's like nowadays it's so easy to like go make money, be scamming, and do oh, this yeah. and do that, and do <laughs> like yeah, I can hustle people. I could sell sell. Drugs. I can get it fast. Yeah, I can get it fast, but it's like, is that really gonna last? It's like yeah. money that comes fast goes fast, mm. but it's like building the proper skill sets, the man that you need to become to then generate wealth, mm. to understand wealth, and do the right thing. That comes from sincerity. Yeah. And that comes from being a righteous person. That comes mm. from doing the right thing, even if you know it's going to take longer. Mm. So it's like, is your goal just the money? And that's what you're going to chase? Then go chase it, right? Yeah. But you you might be first, second, third, mm. but it's going to be sincere. But then if you take your time with it, sincerely trying to create something positive and sell a product that's positive or go out of your way to make sure it's right, then you're going to get that baraka, whether, yeah. no matter what. And when that baraka comes, you won't ever lose it. Mm. So it's like, I think that's like another way that I've seen it as well. Yeah. But so, so you have like the intention aspect of doing it with the right intention, but then you also have the implementation aspect where you're doing it the right way, mm -hmm. taking the proper means, the halal means and so forth. Yeah. So that was even another angle that I didn't really um, think about. I think when when I understood the quote from my teacher. Mm -hmm. No, I really love the quote too. And there was something else that I remember we, were, we talked about, and it was one of your unpopular opinions. And one of your unpopular oh. opinions was the the home birth. <laughs> yeah, like I don't want you to elaborate on a home birth. Um. So, uh, home birth has always been a conversation in in my home. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that my wife in particular was very uh, interested in uh, from the very beginning. Me being your your average, you know, caveman, yeah. I have no idea about home birth. This mm -hmm. is something that must be dangerous, like you must mm -hmm. be out of your mind. Only these people would uh, dare do something like that. Um, and I feel like a lot of men are disconnected from that aspect of life in general, like pregnancy and birth, that's like a woman thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's almost taboo sometimes to even like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, dig it any deeper, you know? Yeah, because it feels like weird to like, why yeah. am I diving into learning about how pregnancies happen or this? Yeah. Or what's best for the woman during pregnancy, the prenatal vitamins or this or yeah. that? So it's like all these little intricacies. But even like the role of the man, mm -hmm. you know, as the guardian, as the protector, you know, that that role does not uh, be forfeit, become forfeit just because it's pregnancy. Mm -hmm. No, you still have that, that role as the protector, mm -hmm. right, and the guardian and to ensure the safety of, of your wife and, and your offspring, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so for us, when we were in Egypt, we were put in a situation that was very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we were to have a birth in the hospital, then we would be subject to certain things that uh, are normal in Egypt. Mm -hmm. For example, during the birth, the man can't be present in the room, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then there would be so many different restrictions as well, and they require all of these, um, what do you call them, when you look into the stomach, uh, with the oh, like the C uh, no, the, no, it's not a C section. <laughs> it's, cat scans or anything? Or? It's not a cat scan. I can't remember the word right now. I can't. I know. It's like, um, oh my goodness! Is when they take the thing and like go over it and like yeah, see what's inside. I can't remember the word right now. That's so funny. Someone just said that word to me like two days ago, and I'm like blanking. Yeah, out. I'm I'm totally blanking right now. But yeah, so they require certain things, extra things. A lot of things that we regarded as very, very unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of did them years before just because ultrasound? this is how ultrasound, this is how the system is set up, you know? Um, so with the discomfort that we had, we actually started preparing for a home birth in Egypt. And we had a doula and a midwife assigned, and they would come to the house during that time. It just so happened that they weren't able to come the night of the birth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And so our options was birth at home or go to the hospital and be subject to that. And just by the way, the C-section rate there is higher than the natural birth rate. Mm -hmm. And the the stories and the narrative over there is very, very bad. 
about the hospital experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And my wife actually served as a doula in Egypt after that. And she got to see with her own eyes and hear with her own ears, you know, a lot of the uh, oppression and, and, and that goes on inside of those spaces, mm-hmm. um, the lies and the fear mongering that happens because people don't want to be there for an eight hour birth, mm-hmm. you know, but if we cut you open, we'll be out of here in two hours. Yeah. It's like convenience over yeah. natural. Yeah. Right. And so we ultimately, uh, put our trust in Allah and we delivered my, our fourth child, um, without, you know, assistance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we went to the hospital later on that morning. We actually went to sleep (laughs) after the birth. (laughs) And then we went to the hospital and got all the paperwork done. And um, just recently, uh, my newest son, four months, we also did a home birth as well. And I mean, my wife has been studying uh, midwifery and and all of those things for the past six years. Mm -hmm. Um, So you were a lot more prepared this time around. Yeah, yeah. It was a totally different experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even in Egypt, like I felt very confident. I was very calm uh, because, again, you know, I tried to pay attention to Allah and I tried to pay attention to Allah's decree, mm-hmm. you know, and I have enough experience in my life that I feel like if Allah brings you to it, then Allah is going to bring you through it. Mm-hmm. Right. And internalizing those stories, if we go back, that, you know, of, you know, Musa Ali Sanam, how many times is he going to escape Pharaoh throughout the course of his life? Right. As a baby, yeah. he escapes Pharaoh and his army. As a, you know, as a youth, he escapes Pharaoh and his army. Now Allah tells him, go to the sea, you know. And guess who's behind him? Mm-hmm. Pharaoh and his army. And all of his companions are beginning to panic. And Musa's like, Kalla inna ma'i rabbi. No, my Lord is with me. Because he mm-hmm. has that life experience already. Mm-hmm. You know, that has. He's not stressed. Yeah, like I've been here before. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I felt like that even for the first time. Like, you know, this is. I'm already in Egypt. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm already here. Um, you know, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, you know, he's going to take care of me, Mm -hmm. you know? So I felt like that then in that moment, it proved to be true. And this time around, you know, it was even more, it was like the culmination of that experience and everything that my, my wife has been studying and kind of like the conversations that we had. And it was the most, I want to say, beautiful birth experience um, and I think my wife would agree that that we had, you know, uh, a lot of people disconnect birth from spirituality and religiosity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like something that has its own space. No, it's a part of your journey. Yeah. As a human being. It's like one of the same, you know, rather yeah. than... Yeah, like Allah you designed you like this. This mm-hmm. is a part of your test. Mm-hmm. This is a part of your journey to him. Mm-hmm. Right. And a lot of people don't channel it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, like, oh, you have the baby now. That's the most important thing. But no, like Allah designed the woman to give birth, to mm-hmm. be pregnant, to carry that in her womb. Mm-hmm. And then he designed it to actually come out from the womb in a certain way. Mm-hmm. That's Allah's design. And what Allah designs is with with, with wisdom. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you take a certain benefit when you go through the process, Mm -hmm. the way it was meant to be gone through. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you lose certain benefits, I truly believe, when you do it in ways that are are contrary to the natural design. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I'm I'm an advocate of of home birth, uh, natural birth more so, right? I don't criticize or judge. Like, I I don't have a problem with hospital birth as as long as it's not intrusive, as long as it's not aggressive, there's mm-hmm. a lot of uh, violence that takes place yeah. sometimes because uh, the doctor is the authority and, and the all knowing, and you know you have to take the you know the, the word of the, the doctor. doctor yeah. and that doesn't. That's not always the case. A lot of people in that position, in any other position, they don't have. Uh, good intentions, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know, um, or they just don't have discretion, mm-hmm. you know, and so yeah, that's that's my unpopular yeah. um, opinion. I would say is is home birth 
definitely an advocate, definitely not against, you know, people doing uh, the hospital thing either, you know, whatever people are comfortable with. But, you know, that's just the way I go. No, I love that. I love like even like the description behind it all and like connecting it like religiously and spiritually as well and how important that is. But before we go, I was going to ask you one last thing. Is there's any like certain like lines or poetry that you want to give to anyone listening? What would you kind of give as a little send off? Um, <laughs> this is on the fly, impromptu. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of default to uh, some of my favorite poetry about the Quran. Mm-hmm. Um, recently, I've been writing more about uh, the Sira, the biography of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. So I have a lot of that kind of inside of me right now. Um, yeah, I guess I would do, so everything the Quran touches turns to gold, so don't be afraid to let it touch your soul, hmm. right? Um, <laughs> that's one of my, my favorite lines uh, of poetry. I have another line about the Quran that goes, um, as long as the heart is captivated by the Quran, then the soul will never be the captive of man. Hmm. Um and so, and so many other lines as well, yeah. just to, to keep it short. Um, actually, I have a book called Touch of Gold. I gifted it to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully, you'll go back and read that. But it's Quran-inspired poetry. Mm-hmm. And so the subject of the book is the Quran. Um, and I've been pushing that for a little over a year. And hopefully soon I'll be releasing my next collection, Sirah inspired poetry. Mm-hmm. And then there was Ahmed, alayhi salatu wa salam, about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mm-hmm. No, that's awesome. And do you have like an online store or anything or links to it? Or? So, yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of Instagram, Ibrahim.jabber, just my name. Mm-hmm. Um, my website is Color Me Muslim. Um, so that's where, that's the platform I'm building. I've Mm -hmm. actually been building it for like uh, over a decade, Mm -hmm. um, where I have a lot of my personal work, but also, um, some resources inshallah for, for youth and classes and these type of things as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll put all like your stuff in the description below. Inshallah. I don't think anybody's going to check the description. You (laughs) go through the description more often than not. So, but thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode of the Oli Canoli Show. Again, today we had Ibrahim, and it was an amazing conversation. We talked about so many different things, <laughs> and in the description, I will put his website. You guys can go check his book and check what he's got on his site as well. So thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>